Thank you all so much for such incredible insight into the scientific research that's currently taking place around long COVID. I've already met our goal today where I've learned something and that was our goal for everyone to learn something today. So I've learned something. I feel like that has added so much to my repertoire. Um, our next session will explore industry specific implications of long COVID, focusing on the pharmaceutical industry with Tom Equals and Rich Mozecki, uh, the healthcare industry with Dr. Leora Horowitz, a legal out for outlook offered by Barbara Comerford, and insight into health insurance with Dr. Raju. Um, they'll be all moderated by our CEO and president, Ovid Amate. If you'd like to come up to the front, please. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we're going to go on with our uh, next session, and I'm just going to uh, just pause for a moment and say that uh, the previous uh, session was uh, incredibly interesting. I think we have a better sense of the uh, the spectrum of uh, of long COVID, and we begin to have some uh, some deeper insights. Um, and I did like you know there was uh, one uh, concept that I took away from uh, from the previous session, which is. Uh, um, thinking about, about cancer and how we uh, uh, used to think uh, of cancer as sort of one disease and uh, obviously now have uh, much, much better tools uh, to understand uh, different, uh, different types. And uh, um, I, I think this, uh, this idea that we can uh, bring into uh, long COVID to post-infection diseases that we need to have better tools. Um, and they may come from other, other fields. So, um, Moving to, uh, to our session, we're really going to explore different, uh, disparate, different aspects of the healthcare system. And uh, um, uh, Dr. Raju and I had a moment before the, uh, um, at the beginning of the event today, and uh, I think we, we acknowledge that it is so important to, uh, to come together you know, for a day like today um, and move away from our own specific uh, um, focuses on different parts of the healthcare system and really consider the, uh, the interconnectedness of, uh, um, uh, of all of that. So that's what we're going to try to, uh, to do uh, in this session. And uh, I will introduce the, uh, uh, the speakers uh, before, uh, before, each, uh, before each one of them um, uh, has their turn. Um, but we're going to start uh, today with, uh, with Dr. Leora Horwitz. Uh, she's the director uh, of the Center of Healthcare uh, Innovation and Delivery Science um, at NYU. Uh, we'll then move to, uh, to Dr. Raju. Uh, she's the senior uh, medical director at Cigna. And then we'll have uh, uh, Dr. Mochiski, who's the uh, chief medical officer of Pharma, followed by uh, Mr. Thomas Equals, who's the CEO of uh, AIM Immunotech. And then we'll close with uh, Ms. Barbara uh, Comerford, uh, who uh, she's the founder of the law offices of, uh, of, of Barbara uh, Comerford, and she will be uh, talking about uh, legal aspects of, of disability. So I thank uh, all of the speakers, and uh, um, this is going to be a, uh, my really first uh, true hybrid uh, session. So I appreciate all the participants, and I can still see some uh, uh, faces on the screen. And at the same time, I have three dimensional figures next to me. So that's really exciting. Um, Dr. Horwitz, we were uh, uh, hoping to, uh, to see you in person. You're in New York and we are in New York, but I understand that you're not uh, able to join us. Uh, but let me just introduce Dr. Horwitz. She's the director of the Center for Healthcare Innovation and Delivery Science uh, at NYU. She's also the director of the Division of Healthcare Delivery Science in the, Depart the Department of Population Health at NYU School of Medicine. Uh, she's a tenured professor of population health and of medicine and a practicing uh, internist. Her work focuses on improving the safety and quality of healthcare delivery. Um, and very important uh, uh, for our topic today, she is currently a co-PI of the Clinical Science Corps for the NIH Recover Program to study post-acute sequelae of uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, she also conducts the federally funded research on value in healthcare and has developed quality measures uh, for the Centers of Medicare uh, and Medicaid uh, Services. Um, and uh, I, I always learn uh, new things when I have to uh, uh, introduce speakers. And uh, I was really delighted to note that uh, Dr. Horowitz was named as emerging leader by the National Academy of Medicine and is an elected fellow of the American Society of uh, Clinical Investigation. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. Horowitz, we're uh, very, uh, very pleased to, uh, to have you uh, uh, today, uh, really to uh, introduce us to the clinical practice, and then uh, also this important study uh, that we call uh, RECOVER, uh, which is really the, uh, the big NIH initiative 
uh, to help all of us understand uh, long COVID in a much, much better way. So uh, Dr. Horwitz, please. Thank you. I'm so glad to um, be part of this, even though I, I can't be there in person. I ironically um, was diagnosed with COVID on Tuesday. Um, so, uh, so this is feeling very personal now. Um, but, uh, but here I am uh, by, by Zoom instead. Um, so I am, as, as I did mention, going to split this talk uh, into uh, a little discussion of, of the, the potential impact of PASC or long COVID on the healthcare system. And then also I wanna pivot and talk a little bit about recover um, because I think it is so, uh, so important to know about. You have all talked repeatedly about what PASC or post-acute sequela of SARS-CoV-2 means. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but I do just wanna um, briefly situate it from the perspective of the healthcare system, um, what we're talking about here. So remember that um, for physicians, we are thinking about um, people with PASC in a variety of different manifestations. And, and so um, we are dealing with people who have persistent injury from the initial infection. Um, so people who lose their tastes or smell from the initial viral uh, effect on the nerves. People who have lung injury either directly from the virus or from the inflammation caused by from the virus or from the fact that we put them on ventilators uh, and treated them and damaged their lungs. Um, or from acute kidney failure from clots during the acute infection. There are many people who have really um, uh, important and persistent long acting uh, organ damage from the initial infection that, that goes on and we have to manage those over time. Then of course, there's the people who seem to have maybe some kind of ongoing injury perhaps um, as you just heard a lot about in the last session um, from uh, either the initial infection or from an autoimmune response to that initial infection or from reactivation of another virus because of the infection or whatever. Um, and those are of course the NECFS or dysautonomia source of symptoms and a variety of other things as well. Um, and we have to manage those. And then um, there are people who it turns out are at higher risk of, of acute events. Um, so myocarditis, inflammation of the heart lining, or yeah. heart attacks, or strokes, or new diabetes, or new kidney failure, that, that can happen in people who have their initial infection and recover and don't have any ongoing symptoms, but six months later suddenly have a heart attack. And although people have heart attacks all the time, um, there's good evidence now that that is more frequent in people who had and recovered from, from COVID. And all of these things influence or affect the healthcare system and how we are gonna manage these over time. And sometimes people are thinking of long COVID as just these people with ongoing symptoms, but, but you know the acute events matter too. And because I know that this community is extremely familiar with the first two categories here, I'm not gonna spend any time on them, but I do just wanna remind you that there's a lot of these other sudden event things happening too. Um, there's a whole series of nice papers out of the, the VA system, the Veterans Affairs system, which is a, a useful, system because people tend to get most of their care there. So it tends to be reasonably comprehensive. These are studies that involve around 150,000 people with COVID and around 5 million people without. They find that among people who survive COVID, starting 30 days after they have their COVID, they are at in fact increased risk of death uh, with about eight extra deaths per thousand people by the time you get to six months. They're at higher risk of having stroke about 50% increased risk of stroke, which is about four extra strokes per thousand people by the time you get to six months. They're at higher risk of this inflammation of the heart lining, myocarditis. They're at higher risk of heart attack. They're at higher risk of getting new diabetes. Um, and all of these uh, really can strain the healthcare system on top of dealing with the people who have ongoing symptoms. So just to kind of put that into context for you, um, CDC says there's 83 million cases. We know there's lots more than that, but at a minimum, let's pretend there's 83 million cases, about 25 million of those are people over 50 who are at risk of these sorts of uh, acute events. That's, we're talking about 100,000, 125,000 extra heart attacks, 100,000 extra strokes, 325,000 extra cases of diabetes. We only have 800,000 heart attacks and strokes in the country each year. This is a big increase for us. And the healthcare system right now is not really set up for managing all these additional events, plus managing the ongoing symptoms and the, um, and the long COVID that we've been talking about. So I think that the direct impact on healthcare in this country over the next few years is likely to be profound and we should really think about that upfront. 
obviously there's going to be a high burden of these chronic fatigue, myalgic encephalitis, dysautonomia type syndromes. And that's a problem, as you know, because we already are pretty bad at that. We're not very good at diagnosing that. We have no idea really how to treat it effectively. And, and by when I say we, I mean the average doctor. Obviously, there are um, uh, centers of excellence and you know, experts here and there around the country, but the average Joe doesn't really know how to manage these very well. And so we need to think about how to educate and how to uh, really determine best uh, methods of diagnosis and of treatment that we can get into the general healthcare community, not just at these sort of scattered places that have experts around the country. We're gonna have a higher burden of cardiovascular and metabolic disease. We're gonna have some more frequent of these acute catastrophic events. And we're actually not sure why those are happening. And so we're not really sure whether our standard treatments are appropriate. So will the sort of standard therapies for prevention of heart attack and stroke work to prevent this kind of heart attack and stroke in the long COVID, we don't know yet. We don't really know the cause, we don't know the right treatment. Um, and as you'll see from uh, this VA paper, the variety of things that people are using to treat symptoms of people who are having long COVID is all over the place, right? So this is just a list of the most common types of medications that are newly started for people after they have COVID. So presumably started uh, uh, to manage their symptoms. Um, the numbers represent the hazard ratio, so the, the increased likelihood of getting one of these medicines compared to somebody who didn't have COVID. And obviously the most common you see here at the top is bronchodilators, so things to treat people who are wheezy like me right now. Um, but uh, we have uh, non-opioid analgesics, so just generic pain medicines. We have anticoagulants. Uh, we have um, cough medicine for people with persistent cough. We've got... Um, a whole slew of muscle relaxants and anti-inflammatories and beta blockers for people who are having dysautonomia and anti-inflammatories. People just have no idea. And uh, these are kind of blunt instrument um, treatments and it's, it's just not clear to us what we should be doing yet uh, to manage. And so people are kind of throwing the kitchen sink at, at these conditions. We're also really not sure where we should be treating people with long COVID best. So, you know, those of you who are suffering from post-exertional malaise and, and chronic fatigue, you can't go to the doctor all the time and go to five different specialists or 10 different specialists, right? That's exhausting. Um, and yet we haven't really set up systems to make it practical and, and, and feasible for people to get good care. The fact that long COVID and PASC is so heterogeneous is also a problem because people have all kinds of different consequences and all kinds of different symptoms. It's really, you know, part of the, we'll talk in a minute, part of the challenge about studying this condition is that it isn't a condition, it's so many different conditions. We have to ask about hundreds of different symptoms. And so there's lots of different experts who might be able or will, are appropriate to weigh in on how to treat these people. And, and that's not so easy to organize and uh, make doable in, a, in an efficient fashion for patients. Long COVID clinics have been sort of proposed as the right answer here, but most of them really started as respiratory focused clinics in the early, you know, sort of spring of 2020, because that's what we as doctors were most worried about, right? We thought COVID was a lung disease. We saw people having shortness of breath. We set up these lung clinics. It's not clear that they really have adequate expertise for the other sorts of symptoms and diseases that people are having. There aren't any standards. There's no guidelines. There's no certification for these clinics right now. And there's a lot of them. We know of at least 66, I'm sure there's many more uh, in the US that have launched COVID-19 recovery programs. Um, so I, I, I'm really just trying to um, situate the context here in which you understand that there is clearly a, a, gonna be a new big burden of disease. We're not yet sure how to manage it. The average doctor doesn't know very much about this condition yet, um, and we don't understand it very well. And so, um, so that I'm going to pivot now to how are, how is Recover going to help with this, or what is Recover? Um, so, Recover stands for Researching COVID to Enhance Recovery, and it's the NIH's kind of umbrella program to learn about the long-term health effects of COVID. Right now, we're doing observational studies. We will move to clinical trials in the, the next few months. But right now, we're doing observational studies, which means that we're collecting information, in many cases, a lot of information, but we're not actually treating anybody 
uh, in the study right now. Right now, what we're trying to understand is, can we, um, uh, can we figure out what is going on with people and can we figure out what the right targets would be for treatments? Um, so you all know this already, what is long COVID? Obviously these are people who are having symptoms and but we think that there's many millions of people who are, who are going to suffer from this over time. So the goal for the observational component of recover is to understand what the trajectory looks like. So what does, um, what does recovery from COVID look like? We have studies for adults, we have studies in kids, we have studies of pregnant people. We wanna understand how many people are getting any kind of long COVID or past. We wanna understand what the risks are for getting long COVID. Uh, so why do some people get it, some people not? We wanna understand what the different sub phenotypes of symptoms are that people get when they have long COVID. We wanna understand uh, why it happens, what is the biology of what's going on in the body with people who are having various sorts of symptoms. Um, and we wanna understand these you know, acute events like heart disease and lung disease and so on. Um, ultimately, the observational studies will enroll up to 40,000 people. On the adult side, we have over 15,000 adults uh, 18 and up that we will be enrolling, plus over 2,000 women who were pregnant at the time that they had COVID and their babies. And we'll be enrolling as well about 20,000 children and, uh, and teenagers. Studies designed to match the population at large in the country who has had COVID. So we're being very attentive to enrolling uh, um, racial, ethnic, rural, educational kind of uh, demographics that match uh, the, the sort of uh, distribution of COVID in the country. And we also have autopsy component. Uh, so that's looking at people who have died after having had COVID. So we could again, look at the biology. Um, I run the adult side, so I'm just showing you uh, our, our topics about the adults here. Um, the important thing to note here is you can take part whether you've had COVID or not. We do want people who haven't had it, although they're harder to find um, because we, um, we need some controls. Um, you can't participate if you're not in the adult side, if you're not an adult, if you um, are having a terminal disease, if you are in prison. Um, and what we do is we have people fill out surveys every three months about their symptoms. Um, at the beginning, we ask them about the symptoms they had before any COVID so we can understand people with pre-existing conditions. And then after that, every three months um, for four years. And then we do some testing as well. So. Um, at least once a year and more often early on, we do a lot of blood tests. Um, we do some basic physical examinations, including tests for dysautonomia. We do um, CAT scans and, and other things uh, of the lungs. We do walking tests, we do physical function tests, we do a whole slew of things. Um, we also collect a lot of biospecimens to reserve for future research that anybody can uh, can um, petition to use those samples for. So we are really trying to make sure that we have adequate samples for people to do all kinds of very sophisticated and new analyses, such as the sort of cytokine things that we were just hearing about. Um, we're recruiting right now in 33 different states, plus Washington, DC, plus Puerto Rico. Um, and again, you know, all 17,000 or so of the people uh, who are enrolling on the adult side we'll have these basic labs and biospecimens and examinations. And then somewhere between three to 5,000 will go on to have additional testing depending on their symptoms um, and depending on, uh, on their trajectory. So um, we will you know, have some additional tests that are pretty straightforward like smell tests or walking tests, all the way to things like biopsies of tissue. Um, so a whole variety of additional tests to make sure that we properly understand uh, what's going on. Um, you can go to the website and see where our sites are, and you could even uh, volunteer to sign up. Um, we have over 3,000 people already enrolled on the adult side, and we're moving along very quickly. Um, so I'm going to stop there and um, look forward to your questions later. Thank you very much, Dr. Horwitz. This was, uh, this was a, a, a great uh, way to, to understand the, uh, the magnitude of the challenge, and I think uh, I will, we'll save the questions uh, uh, until we have uh, heard from, uh, from the other speakers. Um, and I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Manin Raju. Uh, she's a senior medical director at Cigna. And uh, uh, Dr. Raju really has a very, very uh, uh, interesting perspective because she is uh, Cigna's COVID medical director. She works, clo she works 
She works closely uh, with key matrix partners across the, uh, the enterprise to coordinate Cigna's COVID response. Um, her efforts uh, have been focused on improving clinical outcomes and quality. And these include uh, ensuring uh, that customers are supported and have access to vaccines, testing, and uh, treatments. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, Dr. Raju has extensive experience with utilization uh, management, uh, coverage policy, and case management. Um, and as I said, I always uh, learn interesting uh, uh, things about speakers. So uh, Dr. Raju uh, actually completed her residency uh, in general surgery and a fellowship in colon rectal surgery um, at the University of Minnesota. So uh, really very interesting uh, way to get into understanding uh, a management of, uh, of diseases. And she's also a graduate of Cigna's uh, Physician Leadership Development Program uh, uh, recently. So uh, Dr. Raju, uh, uh, please, and I'll... Would you like to uh, use the podium or be prepared to? Fine. Yeah, All right, fine. absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Um, I feel very grateful and privileged to be here. Uh, I was, as Dr. Amitin noted, we were speaking beforehand and um, I feel especially with the overwhelming nature of uh, post-COVID, uh, we tend to get into silos trying to figure out our little piece. And this is just a wonderful opportunity to really understand what everybody's working on and find these common themes um, between the challenges that we are all facing. So um, today, my, my goal this morning is to try and answer three questions uh, that hopefully you will find um, helpful. The first of which uh, speaks to what you just mentioned, which is what are the unique capabilities that we at Cigna have as a health insurer uh, and what insights can we offer on long COVID? But the second question kind of looks back and says, and, and asks uh, throughout the pandemic, as an insurer, what have we been able to do to support our customers and ensure that they have the access uh, to the right care at the right time and the right place. And especially with the um, constraints of the pandemic and, uh, and quarantining, lots of challenges on that front. So what have we done and what are we going to be doing going forward to ensure that, that people get the care that they need? And then lastly, which ties into that is, you know, going forward, what can we do to remove barriers and improve the quality of the care that our customers receive? So going back to that first question, which is what are our unique capabilities? Uh, at Cigna, we really believe in, in power of data as a tool to inform us and help guide decisions. Uh, so on that front, we have been following COVID uh, related data before COVID even, um, before we even had reported cases in this country. Uh, but since then, what we've been doing is we have an analytics team that is very uh, closely following COVID related claims. So we have uh, amongst our customer base, so we have a COVID registry uh, that has over 2 million customers. Uh, and by leveraging the data that we get from claims, as well as machine learning and advanced analytics, what we hope to do and what we're trying to do is to identify customers that need support and tie that into our existing case management systems, identify any trends that we can, <coughs> and really try and make the connections between our customers, our clients, our employers, our brokers, so really um, share that knowledge so that we can offer our customers the resources uh, that they deserve to get better. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't say that, one, that we do have data. However, um, one of the greatest challenges with this data, and Ovid and I talked a little bit about that, is, um, is coding and there, was a code or there is a code that was released in October of 2021 for post-COVID conditions. Um, overall, what we're seeing is that the use of that code is increasing, but awareness in terms of how to use that code and how to, when to use it uh, is probably not where 
it should be that we can use it to accurately um, identify all claims that are associated with post-COVID conditions. So from that standpoint, we're working very closely with providers to ensure that we share that information about um, how to appropriately code for conditions that are thought to be associated with COVID. So understanding those limitations, the data is as good as what's submitted to us. So we don't really have a denominator in terms of um, all our customers that are experiencing COVID related conditions. If it's not submitted with that code, we have to try and get around that and figure out what are the other ways that we can identify customers who had COVID but are not recovering uh, and they're still struggling within the system. Uh, so as I said, we have 2 million customers in our COVID registry. Uh, the majority of these customers do appear to have not been experienced, to have not experienced new health diagnoses. However, there is a subset that has. Uh, and what we did is to look at the time frame before their COVID diagnosis and then uh, about three months after their COVID diagnosis and try and understand are these customers developing new conditions? And what, what we have identified is um, for the most part, the biggest uptick in conditions occurs within um, neurological conditions, behavioral health, and cardiac conditions. One of the challenges though is we get claims, but we don't, we get a large volume of claims that we don't uh, we get codes and we get diagnoses, but we don't have a lot of information beyond that. So um, we have to really be careful about attributing or understanding uh, and attributing these conditions to COVID necessarily. It may be, uh, and we think it is for certain conditions like cardiac conditions, um, it's quite possible that the encounters with the healthcare system uh, help to diagnose pre-existing conditions. But sorting that out is challenging and it adds to the complexity um, of, of making interpretations um, of these new conditions that come to light. Uh, what we can say is that of that database of 2 million customers, less than 1% uh, have had a claim submitted with this new post-COVID code. Again, that's a relatively new code. So um, we're about seven months since the, since the implementation of that code. Our hope is that uh, as we continue to follow our claims data, uh, that the use of this code will become more standardized and we'll be able to um, gather more insights. So moving on to the second question, which was what have we been doing and what are we doing to support our customers that have complex care needs? Um, we're concerned and, and have always been concerned about customers getting lost in the system. It is very confusing. And, and I think as we've learned up to this point, um, there's a lot of theories and it can be quite confusing, uh, especially when you know that you're experiencing, your symptoms are real, uh, but imaging, lab tests, nothing is really producing an answer for you. So how can we help um, these individuals navigate the healthcare system? We have a very robust case management system. And uh, in analyzing those interactions, what we've been able to identify is that for our customers that have been hospitalized with COVID and have a case management outreach after their discharge, they have a significantly uh, improved rate of return to work as well as a lower overall cost of care. Uh, and so what, what do our case managers do? Well, they outreach our customers, they help them understand the post-discharge plan, they can help coordinate these doctor visits. Uh, I, I think for a lot of these individuals, they, they may not have the necessary support from family and friends to 
to even understand um, what, what they're being told to do, who they're being told to see. So just having that outreach is, is a powerful tool uh, to, to help them navigate the system and then also return um, to work. Uh, in addition to supporting these customers with these complex medical needs, uh, it's really come to light the, the powerful connection between um, mind and body. So I think um, the stresses of the pandemic have touched everybody, regardless of whether or not you have a diagnosed um, mental health condition. Uh, but it, it has been a tremendous strain on society. And from that standpoint, we've really worked on expanding our behavioral health network over the past five years. So of course this predates um, COVID, but over the past five years, we've doubled the size of our provider networks. We have 800,000 in-network providers. And in addition to that, uh, um, as within, um, areas outside of uh, behavioral health, we've also expanded virtual care. So at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, less than 2% of our customers were utilizing their behavioral health benefits. Uh, that number has gone up to uh, 25% now. Actually, I'm sorry, I misspoke. Less than 2% um, of behavioral health visits were conducted on virtual platforms. During the height of that pandemic, that went up to 65%. It's now stabilized at 50%. So um, behavioral health and, and virtual modalities are here to stay. Uh, we, had, we noticed a 25% increase in utilization of the behavioral health benefit, um, which is really telling. 25% is, is you know, a very significant number. So that combined, that, that number itself really emphasizes the need to ensure that everybody has access. And so with the large provider network and a significant uh, expansion of behavioral health platforms, we're hoping that we can serve the needs of individuals that, of everybody, but especially those who have um, barriers to access and care. And that's another thing that's really come to light. Uh, our data also confirm nationwide trends that admission rates, infection rates, and mortality rates were three times higher for African-American and Hispanic customers compared um, with their white counterparts. So um, just tying it all in together, our focus going forward is, is really on ensuring that um, we continue to look at disparities, uh, identify customers who have barriers to care, and think about how we can improve that. Um, looking forward, what are the um, areas that we really are placing emphasis on? One of that is ensuring that our providers continue to receive, um, and this is especially within the behavioral health space, uh, reimburse the same reimbursement for in-person visits as they do for virtual visits. Um, that's, that's paramount for us. And then also uh, we continue to advocate for uh, prescribing via virtual platforms um, versus in-person platforms. And then uh, lastly, lastly, as I mentioned, um, expanding our network of uh, providers and partnerships with companies that can help deliver care virtually. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Raj. I think this is uh, really giving us a very, very different perspective on, uh, on trends and how we uh, need to look at it from a macro perspective. So we'll get back to, uh, to that. I'd like to uh, introduce now Dr. Muchiski. Uh, um, Dr. Rich Muchiski is the uh, Executive Vice President of Science and Regulatory Advocacy and the Chief Medical Officer at the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America, also known as Pharma. Um, Dr. Mochiski came to Pharma in uh, 2017 after serving as the Deputy Center, Direct, uh, Center Director for Science Operations uh, for the US uh, Food and Drug Administration, also known as FDA. 
Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, CEDAR, um, since uh, 2013. While at the FDA, Dr. Muchiski brought executive direction of uh, center operations and leadership in overseeing development, implementation, and direction of CEDAR's program. Um, previous to that, uh, pre previous to, uh, to that, uh, Dr. Muchiski was the, uh, the chief medical officer at uh, Genzyme Corporation, where I uh, had the, uh, the privilege and honor to, uh, to work with, uh, with Dr. Muchiski. Um, and I think it's important to note for today's discussion that uh, he is also a board certified um, in internal medicine, diagnostic uh, and laboratory immunology and allergy and immunology and uh, actually maintained uh, a longstanding uh, a clinic uh, at MGH uh, seeing uh, a, a patients. So uh, Dr. Moshiski, please. Thanks Ovid. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak and your invitation to do that, uh, Ovid. It's uh, nice to see you. It's, uh, in person. We've known each other a long time mm -hmm. in person. So it's, it's really great. Um, so, uh, you know, as, as Ovid asked me to speak about giving a perspective uh, from the large pharmaceutical industry, um, I, I think we're extremely proud of what the pharmaceutical industry did for acute um, COVID. You know, uh, from the beginning of the pandemic, um, companies worked day, night, weekends. Um, there was unprecedented collaboration between companies and with the government at many different levels. Uh, with the NIH, of course, but with the CDC, with many, many others um, to try and find the fastest ways uh, for resolution and therapeutic and vaccine agents. So I, I was, um, you know, I, 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 and then when I started to look at, so what about long COVID? And, and there, there's a bit of a different picture. Um, after hundreds of clinical trials uh, that were aimed at acute COVID and for the prevention of acute COVID with vaccines, um, there's, a big difference. Um, so I started by having my staff do a quick search of clinicaltrials.gov and um, to see what was going on, um, both in terms of uh, all trials. Um, and so we found about 141 clinical trials that are going on right now, uh, at least listed in clinicaltrials.gov. But only 23 of those are sponsored by industry. Uh, and you can see the breakout here in terms of uh, a few biologics, um, a few drugs, um, and a few, even more few devices, uh, and no uh, combinations that were being studied by industry. And, uh, you know, this is such a contrast to the hundreds uh, that we've seen before. And then, and, and of those trials that are by industry, the, they're really small companies. You're not seeing the Mercs and the Pfizer's at this moment, uh, who played such a keen role in uh, our uh, attack on acute COVID. So I spent time then calling the heads of R&D to talk with them at many of our large pharmaceutical companies that are members of pharma, and also with their teams that are working on COVID uh, to find out what are they thinking? Where are they going? What do they need? And it was almost a consistent picture from company to company of why they were at this moment still hesitating uh, to go forward. The first thing that they all said was they don't understand what it is yet. We don't really know, but at least, I mean, others might know, but I'll say we don't really know in the industry for sure what the pathophysiologic mechanism is uh, in long COVID. Today, I heard some really interesting uh, ideas about that from Dr. Patterson and others. And so, you know, I do think that um, there are many things, but before you get people to invest the millions of dollars that these clinical trials will need, of course, you need to have sort of more of a consensus set of ideas uh, as you move forward. And, and one of the issues, of course, we've already talked about, I think we've heard it from some of the other speakers, that the symptoms overlap with other diseases, right? I mean, people who emerge 
from the ICU often do have a PTSD-like um, uh, syndrome. Depression is not uncommon, period. <laughs> it's not uncommon uh, and is worse often after um, uh, an acute illness. Um, there are also, uh, you know, pulmonary sequelae that we've talked about too, uh, that can complicate uh, the situation. So, you know, there's a list there uh, of many of the other things uh, that uh, kind of all, like big Venn diagrams, kind of all bubble around this. Um, and so, the real sense that we have a need to really define what it is that we want to attack here and how to diagnose it. And so therefore a real need in the industry for a post COVID-19 diagnostic test. And finally, when we do a clinical trial, what are the right endpoints? There are many different endpoints you could attack, but what are the ones that the regulatory agency is going to accept? And so really, working together with the FDA and getting guidance from the FDA on relevant endpoints uh, would be a critical factor to stimulate um, uh, the attack from the large pharmaceutical companies. Uh, I think uh, all of these could be addressed in some ways, um, but and when they are, I'm confident that you will see uh, the companies engage quickly uh, if they know what the right agent that they should engage with um, is at the present time. I think it's already been mentioned by Dr. Patterson that obviously if you don't actually know what you're treating and you don't have a way to separate it from all of the other entities, your ability to actually discern a treatment response would be extremely difficult. So, um, and we've also just heard from uh, Dr. Horowitz uh, about recover. And, uh, you know, I do think that studies like this from the NIH are going to be really, really critical in helping us start to separate this out, begin to look at things. What I heard this morning from Dr. Patterson on diagnostics, very important steps forward. Um, and I think as we move together um, in collaborative spirit, I'm hoping that we can start to settle on what are the right uh, diagnostic tests. Um, and what is the pathophysiology? Therefore, what are the treatments? Are they anti-inflammatories? Are they immunostimulants? Are they antivirals? Um, what is exactly uh, the right uh, best uh, approach? And I think that uh, we look very much to the NIH for, uh, and the FDA for their guidance, I think, on, on these fronts. So with that, I'll uh, stop pass it on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, again, a very, uh, very interesting perspective, the difference between uh, the response to, uh, to the acute uh, COVID infection and the need to, to deal with the, uh, the aftermath. So uh, uh, still a great, uh, a great need here. Um, I'd like to next introduce uh, uh, Mr. Thomas uh, Equals. Uh, um, Tom is the uh, uh, Chief Executive Officer of AIM Immunotech. In February, uh, since February 2016, um, uh, um, Mr. Eccles received his uh, JD with, uh, from the Florida State University and had a very successful legal career, which included uh, extensive experience in the pharma sector. Um, as I, uh, I think, as we heard from uh, from Dr. Muchiski, uh, there is greater involvement uh, from smaller biotech companies right now, and uh, certainly uh, Mr. Eccles represents uh, one of them. Um, but I, I told you that I'm going to mention one I think that I've learned about, about the speaker. So I also learned that uh, Mr. Equals is a highly decorated uh, combat aviator. Uh, and he was twice awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross um, and awarded the Purple Heart. So uh, Mr. Equals, first of all, we thank you for your service and we'd like to uh, hear from you more about how uh, you're addressing uh, long COVID. Uh, and uh, based on, uh, on previous uh, uh, history. So uh, Mr. Equals, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Amate, and thank you to the team at Global and Sol for uh, your interest in AIM Immunotech and uh, our product Ampligen, which is the drug that uh, uh, we have. It's an experimental drug that uh, we have been 
developing in part for MECFS and long COVID. Uh, I normally wouldn't tell war stories, but uh, since you, you mentioned it, I, I'd like to point out that behind me is, uh, uh, and it's a print of a Picasso <laughs> uh, that uh, is entitled Rest. And I, I have this in my office for a reason. And I, I think back to 50 years ago, this was the spring of 1972, I was a helicopter pilot in the spring offensive, which is one of the most uh, uh, hotly contested uh, periods of combat during the Vietnam War. And I went perhaps three months without rest and due to fear, anxiety, and other combat related uh, activities. So when I, I got involved working with uh, patients who had MECFS, I could be empathetic and understanding uh, what they're going through just from, from that uh, experience I had. Of course, it was much more severe for them. And, and the, the, uh, the fact that it was it, it caused by something internal rather than external circumstances, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't leave the, the scene and get a good night's sleep. So, so you know, I, I, I keep this here to, to help me remember that the work we're doing in MECFS and now that we're doing in long COVID uh, is, is very personal and very important. Um, we uh, identified uh, the relationship between uh, MECFS and uh, long COVID early on uh, with the onset of COVID-19. And, and I'm not suggesting that they're identical. And in, in fact, the work uh, that's being done by Incel DX is, is very much welcomed uh, by AIM because uh, understanding the particulars uh, from a diagnostic standpoint between the two, as well as the ability to track uh, therapeutic response becomes critical to drug development and, and successful uh, 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 you know, movement on a path toward approval. And in fact, our work in MECFS, we're, we're perhaps the only uh, company that has developed a therapeutic that's been approved by any responsible regulatory agency in the world for MECFS, the Republic of Argentina, uh, granted uh, our request for commercial approval for severe uh, CFS. And we're, I believe, the, the only company that uh, with the Implogen that is late stage in the developmental process uh, for MECFS in the United States. And, and the reason for that, I think, uh, as, as was clearly pointed out by the preceding discussion, is that big pharma doesn't understand either of these diseases. So developing these diagnostic tools will become critical to have funding flow in and getting the approvals necessary for drug candidates uh, that may provide an important and meaningful therapeutic response to both of these syndromes. Now, I mentioned that, that we were sensitive early on and uh, once we saw that COVID uh, was moving into a pandemic phase that we could be facing a post COVID uh, flood of chronic fatigue like cases. Now that uh, was based upon a JAMA article and study that was conducted in a Hong Kong hospital after the first SARS epidemic. You may recall that uh, back in 2002, 2003, uh, there was an outbreak of SARS in China, Hong Kong, Indonesia. Uh, uh, what what uh, was instructive there is that in those instances where uh, survivors had the opportunity to report their condition, and then specifically, the study was conducted at a Hong Kong hospital. Approximately 27% of those survivors 
uh, were uh, reporting symptoms which met the CDC criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome. So that that's a fact that that uh, that, that I recalled, and 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 when COVID came out, we analyzed the similarities between SARS-CoV-1, the original SARS virus, and SARS-CoV-2, the virus that is the, the uh, virus that causes COVID-19. And in many, many respects, these uh, viruses are identical and, and, very, and, and in the areas where they're not identical, very similar. So we anticipated that there might be a long COVID problem and, and we began to secure patent protections uh, for Amplogen as a therapeutic uh, at that time. And then we moved forward to try and develop a plan. Uh, and, and again, we're very small. We're, we're not a Pfizer or a Merck, uh, but a plan that would allow us to uh, determine whether or not the impact of uh, Amplogen would have a positive therapeutic impact in long COVID. So if, if we could go to slide number two, please. When um, uh, looking at MECFS and, and as a part of our complete response letter uh, 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 with the FDA, we, we were asked at a meeting to, to examine where there might be in MECFS uh, subsets that responded more robustly to amplogen. And, and we looked uh, specifically at time from onset of symptoms and saw a dramatic increase in response. There was a very significant response to amplogen overall, but uh, we, we saw an almost doubling of the response, uh, positive response, when you looked at uh, uh, less than eight years from the onset of the symptoms. Could we go to the next slide, please? Here, here's a, a graphic depiction of that, which you can uh, study at your at your leisure. But it's a it's a very dramatic uh, uh, Im impact when you look at shorter uh, duration of symptoms. Now, why is that important for what we're discussing now? Uh, the reason it's important is because with COVID nineteen, for the first time, perhaps we have the ability to identify the cause of the chronic fatigue-like symptoms and measure where we are in the uh, uh, spectrum of time uh, following acute disease for purposes of administering therapy early. Now, while um, uh, I, I'm not suggesting that MECFS and long COVID are identical. And in fact, I think the Incel DX uh, presentation suggests there are differences that are identifiable and, and important differences. Uh, there are also very distinct similarities. And with regard to those similarities, uh, uh, we focus on Amplogen's role, which we believe is amplifying the immune modulation uh, response uh, to help alleviate the disease. So um, we have an FDA authorized compassionate care or what's called an uh, er early uh, access type program uh, in MECFS and, and we were able to amend that to allow us to treat uh, uh, post COVID chronic fatigue like symptoms uh, in the early stages of that disease. And we did this for a reason because uh, we, we felt it was important to uh, utilize what effectively is a pilot study to give us some instruction as to whether or not Amplogen's impact in long COVID would be the same or perhaps even better than what we saw in MECFS. Uh, we've uh, had four subjects, uh, all of which uh, had a very strong uh, positive response in uh, the areas of fatigue and post-exertional malaise. Uh, we also uh, you know, have seen 
uh, improvements in, in the cognitive dysfunction uh, part of this uh, uh, disease. So th that's led us to believe that we uh, have a basis to go forward uh, and seek an IND for a phase two uh, type study in uh, post-COVID uh, conditions. So it's specific, but specifically those conditions that we believe most relate to um, uh, the subset that Amplogen addresses. One of the things, and, and I'm going back and forth between MECFS and, and our uh, post-COVID work for a reason, because there are so many similarities. And, and one of the things that uh, is an important similarity uh, with the amplogen responders in MECFS is almost uniformly uh, those who responded to amplogen related. Now, of course, this was anecdotal because remember many of these people, it was years before uh, their, their problem was even identified as MECFS. Uh, but, but an overwhelming number of these people were reporting that their problem commenced with a flu-like illness. So, so we think that there's an, a relationship between that initial perhaps viral insult that flu-like illness and uh, the subsequent um, uh, events leading to uh, fatigue, uh, post-exertional malaise, uh, sleep uh, disorders, and cognitive dysfunctions. So- Tom, Tom we have that two minute warning. Okay, thank you. So, so we're moving forward as rapidly as possible. This, this uh, preliminary work is being done at the Hunter Hopkins Center in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, we're providing Amplogen and, and the service uh, to those subjects for free. And the, the data that we're gathering will be the basis for us moving forward. And I'm very excited about the work being done by Incel DX, and I hope to be able to um, have a one-on-one -on -one with them at some point in the future, uh, with Dr. Patterson, to see how their diagnostic and monitoring activities might help us better explain uh, Amplogen's role in MECFS as well as long COVID. We've had great successes over the past three months with data coming out in our work in cancer pancreatic cancer, advanced recurrent ovarian cancer, triple negative breast cancer. And one of the points that was made by Dr. Patterson is, is absolutely true. Our work with cancer, where we're showing tremendous impacts on overall survival and progression-free survival is not just uh, uh, measured by the survival, but they have the tools to explain why it's happening in immunological terms. We need those tools in this space as soon as possible for us to be successful in finding therapies that will alleviate the suffering of the many people. We're, gonna, we're talking about millions of people who have the severe long COVID, and we want to help them uh, along with uh, others, but we need those diagnostic tools in order to do it, because otherwise, I don't believe we're going to be able to progress with regulators or with big pharma participation and the money that flows from that. Thank, thank, thank you, you very much. Very, uh, uh, very important uh, comments. Um, so uh, we're gonna uh, uh, move to the uh, the last uh, speaker in this uh, session. And I'm really uh, honored to uh, introduce uh, Ms. Barbara Comerford, uh, who's been practicing, practicing disability law uh, in Bergen County, New Jersey. Uh, for over 30 years, uh, and primarily in the area of, uh, of ERISA long-term uh, disability insurance uh, and social security uh, disability claims and uh, litigation. Uh, she's one of the co-authors uh, of the MEC, of the CFS uh, Physician Manual, which was published jointly by the New Jersey Academy of Medicine, the New Jersey Department of Health and Senior Services, um, and uh, um, and has been utilized by physicians and patients throughout the country to recognize and properly diagnose CFS. Um, Ms. Comerford has also co-authored uh, professional journal articles on proving disability in MECFS, including for Frontiers uh, and the journal work. Um, and uh, um, also to note that uh, she has been a uh, member of uh, nonprofit boards as well. Uh, 
Uh, specifically for our uh, uh, discussion today, I wanted to mention that uh, she is on the uh, uh, law line faculty. Uh, and since the fall of 2020, uh, she's done seminar, uh, seminars with them on a variety of topics associated with uh, proving uh, the long COVID-19 disability claims. Um, in 2020, she also presented a seminar on proving the long COVID disability case uh, for the New Jersey Bar Association. Uh, and she's been interviewed uh, on this topic uh, by many uh, media outlets. Uh, uh, so uh, Ms. Gomeford, I'm uh, uh, honored to have you uh, uh, with us uh, uh, today. Uh, uh, please, the, uh, the, the virtual floor is yours. Let me just say that I am honored that the GIC and the Solve Long COVID initiative invited me here today to speak. And I truly mean that. I mean, as you mentioned, I've spent quite a bit of time trying to educate lawyers, judges, and others on not only long COVID, but MECFS, which I have been involved, a movement I have been involved with for decades. Um, and I, a dear friend of mine who served as the president of the CFIS Association of America, that's how far back I go. And I was the secretary of that organization. It was a nonprofit that you know, worked to advocate for patients with CFS at the time, said it only took a global pandemic for people to start <laughs> really taking post-viral illnesses seriously. So I, I am excited and I've learned quite a bit today, listening to the medical professionals that preceded me and my colleagues who were attorneys and who now are part of pharma. Um, I am relieved that I don't have to walk through the steps that I walk through when I present seminars for attorneys with what the common symptoms are with my long COVID clients or my MECFS clients. Um, it is, I am upset to say that we still in the legal community and frankly, quite a bit in the courts don't fully acknowledge that MECFS and long COVID are physical illnesses. I always kind of shudder when I hear behavioral health implications or neuropsychiatric implications in these cases, because for the longest time, particularly because of the incidence of, the, of this, these types of illnesses in females, you know, in the 90s, it was called, you know, hysteria to, to a certain extent. And it was very damaging for the people who suffered from these conditions to have to go and frankly be gaslit so often. So I am so thrilled to see so many well-educated scientists and physicians talking in this kind of forum about it. So thank you all. It's very heartening. Um, the Social Security, my firm practices law, law all throughout the United States. So we litigate cases, not just in New Jersey, New York, and other areas. We litigate throughout the country. And one of the things that we have seen is the absence of objective documentation is really often fatal to the ERISA litigation. ERISA is the Employee Retirement Income Security Act. It is, off, it is benefits, welfare benefits that are provided ordinarily by virtue of employment. So employers try to attract talent by offering them a percentage of their income in the event they become disabled. So clearly people, particularly young professionals, which is what we get, who we get calls from all the time with these illnesses are really excited to know that they, God forbid if the worst case scenario happens, they have a little cushion on the side, not just their 401k or savings. So we are here for individuals who become too sick to work. Uh, one of my clients who worked in global health, uh, who was you know, a very young woman, was told by someone who held himself out as a long, a long haul COVID practitioner that he was very friendly to her when she went there, but after she left, he wrote in the notes that he thought it was a psychiatric case. She had no history 
of psychiatric illness. And she worked in the most devastating um, third world countries and was, you know, vaccinated for everything on the planet because she traveled so extensively. So my first, my primary concern here is absolutely there's secondary issues that the pandemic has brought to light. But I think we need to be very careful and monitor our comments about assessing people with long COVID or MECFS as mental illness cases. And that happens more often than I like. Um, but let me just spend a little time talking about what how Social Security looks at these cases. And I have to compliment Social Security because my associates tell me, um, I don't do the Social Security cases directly anymore. I do most of the litigation, but my Social Security associates, all of whom have worked for me for a very long time, tell me that they have seen a lot of good things happening in long COVID cases that are before the Social Security Administration now. Now, Social Security passed an emergency message for COVID-based disability, which flags COVID cases. They don't flag it to do anything substantively to approve or not approve. They are just keeping track of the number of cases before them. Um, that flag is just for the purpose of identification, tracking, and data collection. That is it. Um, also, Social Security is, it, it's funny because, you know, listening to the sophisticated science today, Social Security seems very rudimentary. They will consider a case, a long COVID case, if there's a positive COVID-19 test, which of course, for people who became very ill in the early stages of the pandemic, is difficult, but fortunately, they also accept a COVID diagnosis consistent with the disease. And those are the telehealth appointments that people had early on in the pandemic and Social Security and where they received that diagnosis and Social Security will accept that diagnosis. Also diagnostic tests to support what they call a medically documented impairment um, such as chest x-rays, cognitive testing, cardiopulmonary exercise testing, objective evidence of organ complications from COVID, and basically any medically um, accepted objective evidence of functional deficits that are that a physician believes are connected to the diagnosis of COVID or accepted. Social Security evaluates all of these cases all the same within the construct of a five-step sequential evaluation process um, where they ask one, is the person engaged in substantial gainful activity? It is a term of art, but Generally, it means do they suffer from such a severe functional limitation that they can't work? Two, is there a medically documented impairment that affects their ability to do basic work-related activities? As we all know, in these long COVID cases, it's not that the person is consistently the same day after day. What they generally have are like CFS cases, good days and bad day presentation of symptoms. And when you have that, it's actually more maddening sometimes for people because they are very functional one day and then they suffer the post-exertional malaise crashes just like MECFS people do. So they have, that has to be documented as well. So I often tell my clients to diary things. At step three, there is no long COVID impairment listing, just like there is no MECFS impairment listing because Social Security has 14 impairment listing to indicate different bodily systems. And they wanna know if this illness meets or equals a listed impairment. Quite frankly, most physicians that I've spoken to said, this is not even medical. This is like some kind of legal construct. So they're really not comfortable trying to plug in those, fill in those blanks. So thank you. We don't have to satisfy step three. We can go to step four, which is, does this person suffer from such significant functional limitations 
that they can't perform the past work they performed in 15 years. And in most of the MECFS cases that we take um, and the long COVID cases that we take, that's not a difficult barrier at all. And at step five, the burden shifts to the Social Security Administration to show that despite these functional limitations, in line with the person's age, educational, and work experience, there are significant numbers of jobs in the national economy. In long COVID cases, just like MECFS cases, we generally approach those cases to document that they suffer from such non-exertional impairments, such as cognitive deficits, such as fatigue, such as post-exertional malaise, that they are removed from the very strict grid guidelines that ordinarily would place a person as not disabled under the social security regulations. So it's- and Barbara, uh, I need to give you the two minute warning. Okay, thank you. The last thing is the ERISA long-term disability claims are where we really encounter a lot of difficulty because long-term disability insurers poo-poo the use of remote testing in neuropsych cases, which of course is crazy in the midst of a pandemic. So we have to fight them on that. They also go through uh, the tilt table testing is not usually done these days, not often. So we usually resort to recommending physicians use the Nasoline test to document POTS and things that support the lightheadedness and dizziness component. And cardiopulmonary exercise testing is often something we urge for people to support the post-exertional malaise and neuropsych testing, as I mentioned briefly, is crucial for so many of these young professionals who come to us because it documents the cognitive impairment. And I must emphasize this, for people who are in the lower socioeconomic parts of our society, trying to get anyone to provide treatment for them that is really based on listening to them seriously is an imperative in this country. I'm so concerned about so many of my poor clients who come to me. We have lots of wealthy people. They're gonna be okay. They can pay for these tests. It's my poor clients and people who are just looked at through a lens of, eh, you just don't wanna work. That really concerns me. And I can't emphasize the need for Centers for Excellence for those people, for long COVID cases and for MECFS cases, because those cases are hard enough to get doctors who are skilled, but they are really almost impossible in urban communities. So I thank you for giving me the opportunity today. And I hope you know I can answer any questions anyone may have. And by the way, anyone who has any questions, please feel free to contact me either via email, call my office. I'm always available to talk to people. Thank you. Th th thank you very much. And uh, we are short on time, but I will take the privilege of just introducing a couple of questions with the request of, of sh uh, uh, short answers. But uh, Dr. Ho, it's one question, uh, and I'm going to consolidate a few questions that came uh, for you. Uh, and the question is, uh, we've heard a lot about you know, a short window of time potentially to intervene, uh, maybe because of changes in the immune system. How do you balance uh, the sense of urgency uh, and of course, you know, the, uh, the need to, uh, this, is, this question has to do with the recover study. How do you balance the urgency to study treatments uh, with uh, this rigor study that takes so much uh, time to, uh, 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 to start and finish? Um, and uh, is there a way as we do that to also uh, be informed and include uh, patients from other post-viral diseases such as CFS and POTS? Um, okay, well, uh, I, I, we are constantly on this tightrope of doing things at, at extraordinary speed for the sort of work that we're doing, and also trying to make sure that we maintain the best possible science and, and rigor. So, um, you know, we enrolled our first participant in, in the observational part of Recover less than five months after we got the funding from the NIH to the Clinical Science Corps, which is, I think, the fastest anyone has ever set up a study of this complexity and size and, 
uh, and um, structure. So, you know, we are we are doing as fast as we can, but we also, you know, COVID is SARS-CoV-2 is here to stay. It's not going to go away. We're going to be having people with these infections for a long time to come. And I think that if in five years time we don't have the science that we wanted from Recover, I, I would consider that a, a, a real loss if we, you know, so we need to make sure that we are collecting the data that we need so that we can make sure that we get the right treatments and the right, uh, the right work. So we are constantly balancing this issue of speed versus uh, doing it right. Um, we are gonna do interim analyses, uh, all kinds of things to make sure that the public is aware of what we have uh, before it's even final because we think that's really important too. Thank you, and uh, obviously you, you hear the sense of urgency from the uh, the community, uh, and also I think uh, in Dr. Muchiska's presentation, uh, the industry is eager to uh, to get some of those insights. So that will be very important to to share any interim analysis. Um, one question to uh, to Dr. Raju, you talked about um, uh, that in your database you do see a. Uh, um, uh, that uh, there was a great disparity in uh, in how. Uh, a, uh, blacks and Hispanics in the U.S. were affected by uh, acute COVID. Do you also have any data on long COVID and disparities in long COVID? So the challenge, as I mentioned, in long COVID is identifying um, really beyond the codes, which of those individuals have long COVID. And so uh, and the, the volume of customers that have been actually, that have claims submitted with those long COVID codes it's like I said, less than 1%. So it's really hard to draw conclusions based on that very limited data set. Um, there are disparities that we have noticed amongst those customers with new conditions. Uh, and so really what we think um, is helpful is to align ourselves with partners within the community to try and um, get the information out there uh, about new conditions and getting really the importance of follow-up care uh, after COVID. Thank you. Yeah, th these data are really important. Uh, we don't have uh, good data in the U.S. Uh, about that, so it's going to be critical to, to get any insights um, on that. Um, and I guess the last question is uh, uh, for Dr. Mochiski, uh, um, and this is, I guess, drawing on your um, uh, experience uh, from, uh, from the FDA. We talked about the need for, uh, this is a complex uh, uh, a disease or you know, a number of diseases. What do you see as uh, the relevance of patient reported outcomes um, as endpoints and specifically issues of quality of life? Would uh, the regulatory agency look at that as a possible endpoint for studies in, uh, in these diseases? I think the short answer is they would, as long as everybody agrees on which one and how it's measured and uh, you know how it's validated. And uh, I, I think uh, uh, there's a long history of uh, this, you know, the, these questions um, and, and, and trying to approve drugs based on them. But I think if it's done right, it, uh, it, it certainly could be a basis for approval. Now that's my opinion. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I see the, uh, the cues from, uh, from the organizers that we need to, uh, to close this session. I really wanted to thank all of the, uh, the speakers. This was really uh, an incredible overview of uh, everything from uh, the, the healthcare, different aspects of the healthcare system. So we will uh, uh, close this session and join in five minutes uh, for uh, the, the keynote uh, presentation, which will be uh, very exciting. Thank you very much.